Hello everybody, recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 54 of the Movement Debrief. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it's about to be a surgical debrief. We're going to talk about sciatica. What are you going to do about that? That's kind of scary. How can I treat that? I'll answer that for you. We're going to talk about the world's greatest stretch. And my hope is to give you the world's greatest answer on the world's greatest stretch. And last but not least, we're going to talk about the beloved back squat. That's what's on docket tonight. These are questions asked from the people, answered for the people, by this people, fam recognized fam. Before I get in, quick housekeeping. Guys, the early birds are still running for the human matrix. If you'd like to learn how to work with people who are hurting in multiple areas, if you want to get people moving and grooving a bit more effectively so you can increase your exercise Rolodex, attend these seminars. I got three of them, September 15th and 16th in Seattle, Washington. Next, it's going to be in Kansas City, Kansas, October 27th and 28th. And last but not least, Portland, Oregon, November 10th and 11th. I hope to see you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people there. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? First question comes from Kelly. Kelly says, I would love to hear your take on best practices for what presents as sciatica. That's Kelly's question. I'm about to give Kelly an answer. So what is sciatica? That's probably what you want to know first. I'm glad you asked. Sciatica is some type of pain presentation that involves the sciatic nerve. So what it's not is just any type of random pain down the posterior leg. That can be a lot of different things because there's a lot of different structures involved in that. So some people will, there we go, sorry Instagram, some people in regards to sciatica will have some type of random pain down the back of the leg and it may not be the sciatic nerve that's involved. Maybe it's a hamstring, maybe it's something else. I don't know the answer to that. So what you have to do is, if we're thinking legit sciatica, we have to rule out the big bad stuff first. The reason why we have to rule out the big bad stuff first with sciatica, because if it's a legit sciatica, a lot of times that will involve some type of disc herniation that's causing that. Because the sciatic nerve has innervations from the nerve roots out of L4 all the way down to S3. So you could potentially have, well, you can't have a disc if I get S2 or S1 because the sacrum is fused. But you could have L4, L5, L5, S1 be contributing factors. It's only sciatica if it is involved along the sciatic nerve tract. So I will link a video in the show notes of how to palpate along the track. But, wow, this is killing me. Okay, but anyways, so it'll link along the sciatic nerve track, that's sciatica. You have to rule out the big bad stuff, so you should do a neurological examination that would involve checking myotomes, so muscle testing, sensation, dermatomes, and reflexes. You want to check along the pathway of the sciatic nerve. If there's problems there, yeah, maybe we got something we need to dig a little bit more deeply into. Another thing you'll want to look up possibly is a slump test. I will link that in the show notes as well. But what that can do, as well as a straight leg raise, can assess the neurodynamic capabilities of that nerve. So for example, if you perform the slump test, you might do some type of positioning, do some sort of structural differentiation. What that is, if you don't know what that is, structural differentiation has to deal with moving a structure that is far away from the place in pain. If you do those things and that evokes either symptoms, asymmetry, or something along those lines, then you may have another thing that implicates legit sciatica. Those would be things to look at to determine what to do from a, from a diagnostic standpoint. Treatment though, I don't really think it differs much than, as it would with any other condition. Assuming that there's nothing drastically wrong, for example, reflex loss, severely decreases in muscle strength, 
you have that, that positive slump test, that cluster of things which may warrant something from a conventional medicine uh, treatment standpoint, whether that's injections to decrease inflammation around those nerve roots, or whether it is even surgery. I mean, sometimes surgery for these cases is warranted. But if you've ruled all that stuff out, the treatment is still the same. We're restoring variability, we're building power, we're building capacity, and we are educating our peeps to let them know, hey, you're gonna be okay, this doesn't mean you're damaging stuff when you do this and that and all the other. So what do you do? You look at your rib cage positioning, you look at your pelvic positioning, you treat those things, you make sure to restore toe touch, all of these things. And this is the crux of my blog. So if you wanna learn how to do that, I will link up a couple things you may wanna check out. But that's really what you do for this kind of stuff. Once you've cleared variability, maybe that individual still has some issues from a neurodynamic standpoint. Maybe they can't do the slump without pain. Or maybe there's a movement that they're doing that reproduces the sciatica symptoms. And you do something with the head and, and that alters those symptoms. That would indicate that there is some issue from a neurodynamic standpoint. Maybe the nerve isn't moving effectively. Given this context, we really don't know. So what you would do after that is restore the neural mobility. That could be involving slides. And yes, I say that because everyone who says that is from Australia. That's where a lot of the neurodynamic stuff comes from, except for um, my boy, uh, wow, Michael Shacklock. He's from, I believe, New Zealand. I hope I got that right. But I will link those guys in the show notes because I've written ad nauseum about neurodynamics if you want to learn more. But you would restore neurodynamic mobility, then you would load power, capacity, teach them the basic lifts, and you ought to be in business. But the biggest thing you want to make sure if you are dealing with a legit sciatica is to rule out that it's not something drastically bad. And a lot of times you can still have sciatic nerve symptoms and it may not be a disc. You could have some type of compression anywhere along the nerve tract that could potentially lead to symptom provocation or evocation. So, you know, your piriformis syndrome, anything along those lines can also lead to that. But as long as you've ruled out the big bad stuff, the treatment is still the same for this. Restore variability by looking at infrasternal angle, pelvic positioning, work through neurodynamics, get them strong, get them conditioned, and you ought to be in business. Kelly, great question. Hunter, I'm gonna lay the smack down on you. Next question comes from Bay, AKA Dave Rasko. Dave asks, yo, why you like the world's greatest stretch? Is it beneficial to stretch everything in the upper and lower body? That's a great question, Dave. Why do I use that stretch? Probably not for the reasons that you would think. Is what well, before I answer why I like that stretch, let's talk about is it good to stretch upper and lower body? And is it good to stretch period? I'm gonna link two articles in the show notes. One comes from Bill Hartman, and this is thoughts about post-workout stretching. The other comes from Lance Goyke, and I believe it's something like why you should stop stretching or you're wasting your time. But basically, stretching probably doesn't do what we think it does, or thought it did. It doesn't lengthen tissues most likely. What, what probably happens is there's some type of change in autonomics. You get some tolerance to stretch, so there's a change in pain perception. And these things can be favorable for a lot of reasons. If it's not gonna change tissue length, is it something we need to be doing? If you like it, it's probably okay. It's probably not gonna hurt anything. If you don't like it, you probably don't need to do it. But where I like something like the world's greatest stretch, which for those of you who don't know what that is, I will link that in the show notes. But one reason I like it is because we have to consider if we're taking someone who is coming into workout and they haven't done a lick of anything on a given day, and we are trying to get them all the way over here to whatever the big move is of the day, whether it's sprinting, whether it's doing a heavy back squat, whatever, we have to bridge that gap somehow. Dynamic stretching can be a way of bridging that gap. And because I'm really not a fan of stretching, I like to do things that take the least amount of time possible that give me the greatest bang for my buck. So if I'm doing some type of resets for an individual to start to establish joint variability, 
then I need to do something that's maybe putting them in those challenging positions, but that's a little bit harder than something that they're doing statically, which typically most resets are static. World's greatest stretch because there's trunk rotation, you're getting a hip separation. That is a much more challenging thing to do and control position than it would be saying uh, a sideline pec twist as an example, which is an activity that I often prescribe. That's why I like the world's greatest stretch. Is it because we're trying to stretch upper and lower body? No. What we're trying to do is prepare that individual to perform the task at hand. Is it essential? I mean, if your only move for the day is a squat and maybe something else, probably not. I mean, I'm sure you could warm up just fine by doing several sets of the squat. But with a lot of the people who I work with, we're doing total body lifts, we're doing all types of conditioning, we're restoring joint variability, and I need to find as many ways as possible to help. Uh, and if we're going from A to C, I need some type of B. The world's greatest stress seems to stretch seems to fit the bill. So to summarize, do we need to stretch upper and lower body? If you like it, sure. If not, you're probably okay. Stretching is good from an autonomic standpoint, possibly, and from pain perception, but you have to figure out some type of way to get someone warmed up, to bridge that gap from not doing anything to doing big things. World's greatest stretch is somewhere that fits on the lower side of that, but can be very useful. And if you utilize that, you do it appropriately, especially the trunk rotation component for you narrow infrasternal angle people, you probably will be in business. So Dave, great question. Last question for the day. Comes from Joseph. And I believe this is Joseph from the UK. How would you coach a good old barbell back squat? Would this look different for wide versus narrow infrasternal angles? That's a great question, Joe. So I will preface, I'm not big on the back squat in the sense that I don't program it much because you have to look at who I work with. I predominantly work in an outpatient rehab setting. We don't even have a barbell. So that makes it really tough to back squat anyone. And a lot of my on client, online clients who I work with are either in the post rehab realm or just want to move better. And I don't have many people who are just, hey, I wanna get after it. So those are some reasons why I don't program it too often. But I also think it's a very challenging move to do correctly and, and coach correctly because it requires some extreme end ranges to be able to get into. Me personally, if I try to get into a back squat position because uh, the movement here is not so desirable, it's kind of uncomfortable. So I don't do it too often. But the key, and really this is the key of any squatting variation when you're coaching it, is to make sure that your weight, the barbell, stays over the midfoot. This is the line of gravity within the body. There is a line of gravity that runs from the mastoid process all the way down to the midfoot. And if you can keep implements along that path, you don't get overutilization on either side of the body anterior and posterior. So you don't get too much of the extensors, too much of the flexors. We want the middle. So when I am descending into a squat, the bar should look like this ideally. Straight down over the midfoot, straight up over the midfoot. So that's really what I'm coaching my people to be able to do. And the way that you can do that in any squat, what you have to do is not sit your tush back because what that's gonna do, and keep a vertical tibia, because what that's gonna do is that's gonna dump this all the way forward. You're out of the line of gravity. You're having problems, fam. What you instead need to do is coach pushing the knees forward, keeping them centered over the foot, and dropping your rear straight down. And if you do that, a lot of times that bar path is much easier to maintain. That's the biggest thing with this. And that's what also makes the back squat the most challenging. Because when I put this on my back, I have to create some semblance of an arch just to get the bar into a good position. This makes it very challenging for us to get the ribcage in a good position regardless of your infrasternal angle selection. 
So that is why a lot of times you'll see people do the squat morning is because they get here, because they create that arch, they run out of end range at the hip joint a lot sooner, so they have to bow forward to try to achieve some semblance of depth, or they do a butt wink because they hit end range hip flexion, and what they do is they posteriorly, either posteriorly tilt the uh, hips, or they create excessive lumbar flexion, something happens, who knows. But that's what makes the back squat so challenging, is it requires a great degree of mobility and coordination to be able to get into that position. Is there a difference with a wide versus a narrow infrasternal angle from a coaching standpoint? I would say by the time you get someone here, if you're talking from a beginner, you should probably already have that addressed before you even go down this pathway. The exception, well, although I will, and the reason why I say that is because on the continuum of exercise selections from a squat, the back squat is probably the the, the last progression you would go to for someone. And that's why a lot of the people who I work with, I don't take there because they have a hard enough time doing a zercher squat, a, a goblet squat, or a front squat even. And those, because there's anterior loading and you can keep the rib cage in a little bit better position, those are much easier to perform. All that being said, if you've addressed variability and you still want to get someone back squatting, uh, I don't think it's essential to have that. I think back squat unto itself is a skill. And if you don't believe me, go to Pat Davidson and look at any of his videos doing any back squatting. He's got a pretty good looking back squat. Like, it's unbelievable. And I've assessed Pat, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, because he's hashtag Team Sagittal, but I've assessed Pat personally, and my dude cannot move in any direction but from back. Like, he doesn't have the rotation. He does not rotate anywhere near as well as I do in the shoulders or in the trunk or in the hips. But he has a way prettier back squat than I would ever dream of having. So there is some skill-based thing to this as well. And a lot of that skill is just being able to, like I said, maintain that bar over the midfoot. And maybe it is in the context of weights because he can move big weight. It can allow him to descend and make it look pretty. I just, I really don't have a good answer. So we have some type of thing where there's this skill piece with the back squat and then there's requiring enough motion at the joints to be able to get into position. And the amount that each of those people, each of those qualities you need to successfully perform a back squat is probably individualized and idiosyncratic. For the overwhelming majority of people, I don't think a back squat is essential to get the gains that you're trying to get, unless obviously you're going to be powerlifting. So any type of anterior loaded or even a safety squat bar can get you a lot of the same benefits. But if you do desire to back squat, what I would recommend is practice it, one, making sure you can maintain that bar over midfoot position, and two, if you feel like you are practicing the move and you can't get into positions, you might want to go down the variability pathway, restore your infrasternal angle, pelvic positioning, all of those things, so you at least have the fundamental qualities necessary to potentially do the back squat well. And if you do those things, you might be on Pat Davidson's level. Who knows? Doubtful. Otherwise, guys, I think that's all I got for tonight. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in. If you want to learn more, there's a few spots you can find me. First off, go to zackcouples.com. What I want you to do while you're there is sign up for the newsletter. There you'll get, like, I think we're up to like four and a half hours of talks. A lot about breathing, a lot about pain. Yep, Jack, appreciate you, my man. We're going to, you're going to get... Uh, weekend goodies every Friday. You're going to get exclusive offers. You're going to get a free acute to chronic workload calculator. You're going to get lots of cool stuff. You definitely want to check me out. Sign up for the newsletter. Also, I offer three services while you're there. These services entail movement consultations. Maybe you can't back squat and you want to see if maybe this variability stuff will help you. Or maybe you, got some, you think you got sciatica or you're just not moving as well as you'd like to and you just want to see if, hey, maybe if I move better that would help, I can be your guy. Check me out there. Or I can mentor you on doing this with your people. 
Maybe you have people who have sciatica or can't back squat and you want to figure out why. We can dive down the rabbit hole and get you the answers you need. Hit me up for the mentorship session. Last but not least, maybe you just want to get straight up gains. Maybe you're stronger than Pat Davidson. I might not be able to get you that level, but we'll get you at least along the pathway. Definitely sign up for online training. You can also, if you don't want to look at me and you just want to listen to me, go to iTunes or Stitcher, look up the Zach Couple Show, because guess what? There's 53 other debriefs that you could listen to. Definitely check me out there. Subscribe, review, spread the word, increase the fam. Last but not least, go to your social media devices. On Facebook, my, I am slash Z Couples. On Twitter, the handle is at Z Couples. On <laughs> that Instagram baby, you can hit me up at Zach Z-A-C Couples, C-U-P-P-L-A-S. And on YouTube, just search Zach Couples. I got a huge channel full of a crazy exercise Rolodex that you can use with your people. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you keep it real, but not to the extent when things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.